Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Warcraft News. Patch 8.2.5 is coming on Tuesday and we have extremely interesting information regarding the performance of World of Warcraft Classic. Of course, yesterday we just put up the most recent episode of our complete history of World of Warcraft series, so be sure to check that episode out. It is a really good one, I mean. Old school Alteric Valley. It's really, really cool. And if you'd like to support the work that we are doing, you can check out our Patreon, where for 25 bucks a month, you will get a thing full of goodies sent to you in the mail. And this month is Druid Month. So that's all quite lovely, but let's get into the news. So today we're diving into the numbers driven by World of Warcraft Classic success. And while the Twitch numbers and the server queues, they've been nice to see, they certainly have indicated that things have been going well, well, what we're going to cover today is our first hard data. And from it, we'll see the success of Classic, we'll be able to speculate about World of Warcraft subscriber numbers and general health, and be able to further analyze the World of Warcraft business model and where it's going to be going in the near future. Now, this report comes from analytics firm Superdata, who have most recently published their monthly report. Now, this is just a summary. The actual reports are extremely expensive to get a hold of, and of course, their NDA to help. But thankfully, the highlights do actually cover all the data that we're going to need for the purposes of today's video. So they track the top revenue by game across PC, console, and mobile on a monthly basis. Now, World of Warcraft West ranked seventh in their June report, but it dropped off in July. Now, their August report, the most recent one, that puts World of Warcraft West at rank 3, with them reporting that the game has experienced a 200 and 23% growth in subscription revenue, but the total revenues are still below the launch of Battle for Azeroth. And there's actually a lot that we can learn from this, and we're going to start off the analysis by diving into World of Warcraft subscriptions. So, Blizzard, as we know, stopped reporting subscriber numbers in Warlords of Draenor. I think with them seemingly, well, just seeing it as a bit of a lightning rod, a kind of validation for those who are critical of the game, but also, and I do think correctly in financial terms, them seeing it as not being a great indicator of overall revenue. Now, I do think that's for the worst, but it is the case that World of Warcraft revenue is significantly, well, it's heavily driven by additional purchases past the subscription fee. And that is something that was noted in the post-Battle for Azeroth Activision Blizzard earnings call, where they noted the expansion saw strong participation in value-added services. So you really can't tell that's a major part of the arithmetic that they're doing. Now, Battle for Azeroth actually set a sales record for the franchise with Blizzard boasting their 3.4 million sales by day one. However, it's worth noting that many, perhaps most of those, were actually pre-orders. Um, now, this was driven, of course, by the instant level boost on the access to Battle for Azeroth's Allied Race feature, plus the leveling revamp of patch 7.3.5 that went along with it. Unfortunately, we actually have no idea how many subscribers this 3.4 million by launch day sales actually indicated, or, you know, equated to, but we do know that Warlords of Draenor sold 3.3 million units at its launch, and it spiked just north of 10 million subscribers. And it also, while it did have a cool trailer, didn't have Illidan. And on that, Illidan, through the Legion expansion, sold 3.3 million units, actually 100k less than Warlords of Draenor's launch, but still tremendously successful. And again, with Legion, we don't know how many subs there were at launch. The 10.1 million number that was floating around for a bit there, like, that existed, but Blizzard denied it, with it widely being believed that the source interview was either misunderstood or mistranslated. Now, I do think it's safe to assume that Battle for Azeroth started off with nearly 10 million subscribers, but I I think the real story here is how many of those people actually stuck around. So, to that goal in October of 2018, we attempted to get a better handle on this by looking at the total number of level 111 plus characters across EU and NA realms. Of course, knowing that a 111 plus character would be owned by an active Battle for Azeroth player. So, we polled our audience to find the average number of characters per person, getting a number of 3.79. Running the maths, it gave us one 1.21 million active endgame players across EU and NA servers. However, it's worth remembering that because they're engaged with sort of World of Warcraft meta content, our audience will be more engaged than the average WoW audience. So if the average was maybe two level 111 plus characters per player by October, then we'd be more like 2.3 million active endgame players of World of Warcraft. Now add in China and Korea plus non-endgame players, and you likely are looking between four and six million retained players, though it really is quite hard 
hard to tell. What is relevant to us, though, is that the super data numbers are for World of Warcraft West. So that's where the 223% increase in subscription revenue actually happened. So how many subscribers will have stuck around to patch 8.2? Well, that bit is actually quite hard to tell, though many will have stuck around only on a technicality because they will have purchased the sixth month subscription promo back for the M the Dreadwake. Now, patch 8.2 was received positively, so it likely did bring many people back, leading to an increase in subscription revenue for the month of June. Now, also note that super data is not tracking subscribers, it's tracking subscription revenue, and this is key. This is really important because Blizzard launched another six-month mount promo on the 27th of June 2019. This will have led to higher than normal June and July subscription revenues due to Blizzard getting six months worth of money from people up front, driving up their average revenue per subscriber for those two months. Now, that's particularly relevant because the 223% increase is over July. That is a month that will have been bolstered by the launch of the raid and the ongoing six-month subscription incentive. And what this actually means is quite impressive, as the subscription revenue per player for August, I expect, will have been significantly lower, because I imagine most of the classic players will just have been purchasing a single month for $15, rather than, say, their modern game counterparts, who were maybe signing up to big six-month bundles in the month previous, with many more just being on a rolling three-month subscription. Now, this change in average subscription revenue per player, that does actually make it essentially impossible to accurately predict World of Warcraft subscriber numbers, but if we were to assume identical subscription revenue per subscriber, and then maybe 8.2 had like 2.5 million Western subscriptions, then Classic would have over doubled the game's uh, Western subscription base up to 5.575 million. However, as I said before, I do believe that that number is actually a good bit higher. I would not be surprised, indeed, if Classic took them closer to 8 million because, you know, the average revenue per subscriber will have been lower because it's single month, but it's still got a 223% increase. Now, of course, this is not counting in China, where I assume Classic will have done quite well, given the game's pretty deep historical impact in that region. Now, revenue-wise, this is, of course, still a massive increase in subscription revenue, but it is less than Battle for Azeroth's launch, and that does make sense. That's not surprising. First, BFA cost $49.99 plus $14.99 for one month subscription. 3.4 million sales at $64.99 is a lot of money, $220 million, plus Activision Blizzard did note strong participation in value-added services relating to BFA's early life. Now, that's not where the story ends, as Blizzard have very clearly timed their content releases to match up with Classic. So, and this really brings us into the 8.2.5 section of the video and the broader analysis of World of Warcraft as a business. So, 8.2.5 is coming out tomorrow, and it will contain the final stage of the war campaign. While Classic came out on the 27th of August, 8.2.5 comes out on the 24th of September, so it's very clear that patch 8.2.5 has been timed in order to keep those one-month Classic subscriptions from lapsing. This is even more clear when you look at the changes that Blizzard are implementing with the war campaign in Battle for Azeroth, where they're essentially removing all reputation requirements, allowing fresh players to play through the whole thing pretty much in one sitting. Now, given the headlines that they likely aim to generate with Tuesday's content, drop, I think their plan here is pretty darn clear. Now, this will especially be the case if they leave the Tuesday content drop on a bit of a cliffhanger with the rest of the war campaign releasing over the coming weeks. And given how that's something that they have done with every other stage of the war campaign so far, I think it stands to reason that that plan will continue. Now, also take into account that they've been running a 40% sale on Battle for Azeroth, and I think it's very clear that they are trying to both retain as many subscribers as is possible and get these new classic players over in into Battle for Azeroth. That really will be one of their largest goals as a business, because Battle for Azeroth is a significantly more deeply monetized product than Classic is. So, how do they plan to keep the momentum going past that? Well, they haven't said yet, but Phase 2 of Classic is going to bring Zuragos, Kazakh, and Dire Maul, and I do believe that will release pretty darn soon. There's also going to be BlizzCon, and I predict that Blizzard will also do a live stream to reveal Patch 8.3 at some point in October similar to how they did patch 8.2, and I think that would pave the way for an expansion announcement in November. Now, once November is over with, they'll of course have patch 8.3 coming out, most likely in January, and then they'll probably have, uh, well, phase 2, you know, either released or very close to being released at that stage, with phase 3 of Classic probably rolling out in Q1 or Q2 of next year, along with, of course, the beta test for 9.0. 
As you can see here, this is going to result in a very vibrant World of Warcraft news cycle, and this is especially the case as the current game is targeting players emotionally through the use of fan favorite characters, or at the very least with Sylvanas, characters who have proven themselves time and time again to be pretty significant audience draws. So overall, I do believe that Battle for Azeroth's second half will be significantly better than its first half, but I do think it will retain many of the fundamental gameplay issues that have hurt the expansion, and I think it will continue the rather divisive storytelling that has characterized the expansion thus far. While it's not a complete recipe for success, I do think it's going to be a strong one for engagement that uh, will be backed up by the game, you know what, probably being a lot better. I mean, if 8.3 continues the positive trends of 8.2, I actually think it would be a very good patch indeed that probably would be worth playing, just like how I think 8.2, yeah, pretty much was worth playing and was full of really good stuff. Now, add on top of that classics engagement, and I think World of Warcraft is in for a rather atypical but strong period of performance. Now, the most important factor here will be 9.0, as its reception will either prove or disprove World of Warcraft's TikTok trend, with, you know, Mists of Pandaria being great, WOD being bad, Legion being great, Battle for Azeroth being bad. If that trend continues, then, you know, 9.0 would be good, and Blizzard would find themselves with, we could say, Legion-like uh, performance, now, if that's Legion-like performance with BFA-like monetization, that's going to be a lot of money, and they'll also have Classic doing quite well. And as skeptical as one may be towards Classic's long-term retention, it is true that things like gearing just do take a long time in Classic, and while it certainly will have a dip in players, I do think that events like Anchorage and Naxxramas will be large audience draws. As for the long-term of Classic, I believe that BlizzCon 2020 will have Blizzard reveal their longer-term plans. Now, personally, I've been hoping and long advocating for an old-school RuneScape-like model where the game's development would actually continue with its original spirit being the guiding force there, so we would see new WoW Classic content. I think the TBC and Wrath servers would be fine, of course, but I think that past their release, they'd mostly be a dead end as far as the business model goes. And I think when Blizzard look at what they've got here, they look at the audience that they've captured, I've got to suspect that they'd rather have themselves running two highly profitable MMORPGs that have a solid content plan, long-term viability, and a strong cross-promotional element. So there you go. That's what I think about the 8.2.5 release date and also the analysis of the recent Super Data report. Combine this with, I think, what we're going to see at BlizzCon 2019. And uh, I mean, I do think Blizzard actually, I, I do think that Activision Blizzard's probably going to be going in a good direction. Now, I say that in terms of its stock price, not necessarily in terms of the quality of its games and the respectfulness of their business models towards the players, but certainly if I was going to be throwing money into a game stock, I have a feeling that, well, I don't think they're as undervalued now. I think if you were buying stock before Classic, then, well, a good bit before Classic, then I think they would have been undervalued given their long-term trajectory. But if you consider Modern Warfare seemingly being quite good and uh, what I think Blizzard have got planned with Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4, yeah, I think they maybe even still could have an undervalued stock. Now, that said, there is a lot to suggest that the Call of Duty Competitive League and that the Overwatch League are significantly overvalued, that they're not generating revenues in line with their, I believe, upwards of 20 million per team spot um, sales, you know, sale prices for the, you know, the team franchises. So if that sort of esports angle to their business pops, I think that could lead to quite a large problem in terms of what the markets perceive. Uh, a lot of the esports money, I think that's hedged on very, very lofty expectations of growth. And if that is not achieved, then yeah, there's obviously there's obviously going to be a bit of a problem there. But anyway, that's basically my thoughts here. And I suppose if you are interested in more of the business analysis stuff, do check out our second channel. Like we release five to seven videos there a week, sometimes even more, and you probably would enjoy that quite a bit. But anyway, that is it for this video. Of course, if you want to support what our team is doing, you can check out the Patreon and then also the Complete History of World of Warcraft, which we just put a new episode up for yesterday. Thank you very much for watching this video, and I will see you next time.